Welcome to the 19th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Huey Wenlin from Michigan State University. She received her PhD in 2006 from uh, Columbia University. After that, she had a postdoctoral fellow position at the theory group of Jefferson Lab between 2006 and 2009. Between 2009 and 2014, she was a research assistant professor at the University of Washington. Then a visiting assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley for a year. And she joined uh, Michigan State University in 2016. Over the years, she received a number of awards and honors. I'll just mention two. In 2017, she received NSF Career Award. Uh, and in 2020, Cortrell uh, School Award for unveiling the three dimensional structure of nucleons. Uh, she is very active in the professional service. Uh, she was an elected member of USQCB Executive Committee. She is an organizer, chair, or member of numerous conference uh, committees. Uh, she is also a member of International Lattice, uh, Lattice uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. She has uh, a wide uh, research interests uh, on lattice methods in nuclear physics, nuclear properties, uh, particle distributions, hadron spectroscopy, electromagnetic form factors, and many more things. And today she will be talking about mapping the structure of hadrons with lattice QCD. And with that, I'll give the word to uh, Hugo Wen. Wen. Thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you for having me here. Um, so today I would like to talk about the pattern distribution of the hadrons using latest QCD method. And so the, as many of you probably not all uh, strange to the pattern distribution function, also often show as PDF. Um, sorry, let me turn on the laser pointers. Um, so, so we have been uh, doing a lot of collision experiment for the more than last half of the centuries. And so we, we have quite again quite a lot of information about this universal uh, distribution of the nucleon, and we start to really uh, open door to study other hadron like uh, pions and kaon and, and more exotic ones. And so there are a lot of ongoing and playing experiments in the US. There are uh, Blue Heaven Lab, Jason Lab, that was still uh, actually uh, taking data um, to resolve some of the large uh, X regions of the PDF. And in Japan, they are also uh, plan to, uh, in JPEG, also plan to study some of the structure. And in Europe, there are campus GSI. And then, then the very famous one we know of in US, which is the electron ion collider, which you likely going to uh, gain a lot of information that we don't know about the, the structures, especially uh, we are very, uh, I would still really want to make out the, the image of the proton, which is the fundamental building block in the nuclei. And so, and I still, I'm using this picture from this the slowly older version of the white paper, because I, I think it really capture of the, the capability of EIC really to form in those uh, nice images and for us to better understand a lot of mysterious, uh, the, uh, the remaining unknowns of the structure form. And so, so they are having uh, quite a lot of efforts in the past few decades uh, trying to combine all the a lot of uh, interesting experimental results, which often at different kinetic regions. And so it's not straightforward to combine them. So often you need certain theory inputs uh, to be able to form a nice uh, uh, pictures of the, the global, uh, of the pattern distribution function. And so because there's a, a, such input involved that they, they actually can be multiple version of the pattern distribution function. And so different big club, different glue have been trying out using different data set and some, some theory of it's better to deal with high energy regions. Some theory allow to have certain correction from the all energy. They can uh, use a different type of data. So you are seeing, we are seeing a very different version of the pattern distribution functions. And there are also choices that one can make in terms of maybe things like the strong coupling constant, we are still trying to understand and, and pre precisely determine that as well. So there's also a choice of how, where, which are the scale you set them, you get slightly different version of PDF, uh, whether you use uh, permutations or not. And often uh, they, they, they might be a different way of selecting the basis to, to try to extract the, the PDF, it might vary 
I might vary a little bit. And then, then there's occasionally when data are really scarce that we have to make some assumption to try to get a non-zero PDF determination. So one of the common um, assumptions that have been made in the past few years is this uh, strange, uh, anti-strange symmetry. And because the data was just not precise enough, it, it actually people have tried various different way uh, or try to make the assumption. At the end, the PDF doesn't really alter that much, right? And so, so sometimes people even just kind of set them to be related to the anti-quark, anti-light quark, uh, somehow uh, assuming a linear combination and it still fix the data. And this is really just not, it's not much one can do. One can still try to get the base version out of them, but, but due to the limitation of the precise experiment data, then that's, uh, that's kind of the best thing we can do. And so, so here they are. So typically you're gonna see uh, uh, that, sorry, let me just move the zoom away. Okay. So typically you're gonna see some uh, some of the, the PDF agree very well in the region when data is uh, it's a lot of data to constrain the fit. So here just uh, was a, a few of the characteristics plot I taken from the CTA GLI group. Uh, it's a little bit out of date, but still roughly tell the, the same story of what we know about PDF. So in the intermediate region, which is roughly 0.1 to some regional points by six also, they, they don't see a big description from different a color band, which integrated from different way of determine the PDF. But at the large X, for example, in terms of the dequad distributions, uh, they can actually see the, especially as approaching to large X, and you start to see the, 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 the central value deviate quite a lot as well. And you can see similar picture, say for the strange, for example, uh, you can see the various different band correspond to different PDF, they can result quite differently. And there's not much information sometimes in the larger X. And same story apply to the anti quark or the, the gluon uh, distribution in the larger X as well. And we are hoping that, um, I mean, there are machine that's gonna be turned on and experiment gonna ongoing, but we are hoping that using latest QCD in the show, uh, in the near future, we'll be able to help uh, resolve some of this, provide that, information that is really hard to get from experiment setup. And so that these two, okay. Um, A the good question. Right yes. Uh, there was everything normalized by something CJ15. What exactly does it stand for? Uh, so, so this is just so the, um, the, the, the C tag jet at the year 15, 2015. So because they often release multiple versions of that, people have a different way of um, knowing that which PDF are you talking about from the same collaboration. And so sometimes people mod them by year, uh, the NM PDF have been modeled by versions. So that you are gonna see like 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, et cetera. I, I think the latest one's 4.0 now. And similarly, uh, it's different group have their own choices. So we know when we say NMPDF, uh, which version are you talking about? Uh, you probably misunderstood. There is a ratio D over DCJ15, but there are two right. different versions of CJ15, like 10, uh, T equal one and T equal 10, uh, so. Oh, um, okay. I think it's T equal to one in this case because everything normalized to one. Yes, sorry, I'm, yeah, I misunderstood that. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so, so I'm going to briefly introduce uh, a little bit about how we do uh, such calculation on the latest. And especially, uh, I'm gonna use the nucleon as an example because that's kind of the, uh, the hardest calculation uh, for a long time on the latest structure related calculations. Mm -hmm. And then I will give some uh, result on how, how we do that using the traditional moment method and what that can uh, help us understand in terms of PDF. And then the second half of the talk, I want to talk about a lot of recent assignments on using the, the, uh, the new method uh, that allow a lot of latest calculation to um, extract the Bilkin X sentence of the pion and nucleon structures. So we'll give some of a very quick overview on what's been done, uh, of some of the results that we also apply to generalize pattern distribution functions. And then a little bit on the future prospect and, and challenges. 
And so uh, it, this is going to be a little bit of the bias selection <laughs> of the result I'm showing rather than the uh, as a whole uh, community from the latest and many bias toward the, some of the work my student and postdocs have done in, in the past. But, the, but it's roughly along the way what the latest is, our community is heading as well. All right, so for those who are not uh, familiar with the latest QCD, uh, it's a really uh, uh, it's a nice idea uh, the theoretical tool to investigating the strong coupling regions of the, the the quantum field theory, especially for the single hadrons that we are now uh, getting better hands or uh, be able to do a lot of calculation more precisely. And what we do is we take in the the path integral. Uh, and we, we rotation it into Euclidean space. So we have an hour uh, integral that we can put it on the computer. And like the continuum uh, uh, QCD, we also have a quant mass parameter, but in our case, we can open tune that because it's an input parameter in the actions. So we can tune that quant masses. And we often do so when we are trying a uh, uh, new idea, new method, uh, the heavier quant masses usually translate into cheaper latest uh, computational calculations. And therefore, we often try a new idea with much heavier, uh, uh, farther away from physical quant masses. And as we get confident on how things work, then we can spend a lot of time uh, moving the pion mass to closer to physical quant masses. We can remove that assumptions. And we also have an ultraviolet cutoff. That means that we have when a small. One chaos. chaos. Chaos too? Right, so there is also a strange quad dependence and we often, yes, we were, but because strange quad is, or is uh, about 20 times heavier than light quads. Right. So we, it's, it doesn't actually add a lot of computational cost to, to be make, make the strange quad heavier. So with, typically people try to end a strange quad really close to the, the physical ones as much as we can. And we often tune it in terms of try to fix the uh, some of the uh, with with the hard drum masses that we know well, and we can often fix the strange quant masses to to the physical one. So that's less an issue, right? And and so we have this uh, uh, resolutions that we have. You can think about as a picture, right? We want that resolution to be as small as, as high resolution as possible. And that means we want smaller latest spacing as possible. But again, uh, you run into the, the simulation uh, computational cost. So one often had to, again, study the A-dependence effects. And then we also will have a, a infrared cut uh, That means we have a, a largest uh, scale in the, in the system that we simulate so that we don't end up with infinite degree of freedom. We can actually simulate that on the uh, computer either. And so at the end of the day, we want to make sure our box is big enough so we are not uh, kind of alter the physics because we put uh, we squeeze the, the hard drum in our simulation. And so at the end of the day, we need to recover to the physical limit so we can compare with uh, a lot of homological determination or experimental results, et cetera. And so we, if the pion mass is not directly simulated at the physical pion mass, we may sometimes study a couple of the heavier ones as closer to physical one as possible and do an extrapolation. And sometimes multiple simulation and the heavier quant masses actually turn out to be still cheaper than directly simulated physical quant masses. This might be quantity dependent as well. And we would like to have latest spacing as small as possible, preferably somewhere, uh, it depends on the physics of people's interests. Some of the simulation might require one to have very, very small latest spacing about 0.042 for me also. And, and sometimes we, again, we will study multiple latent spacing and take the extrapolation if it's not done this way. And similarly, we will also study the value dependence or do an extrapolation. And that's how we get the, the reliable latest result that we can compare uh, with everybody else. So, um, so this had been around for the while. Uh, the idea was proposed in the 70s by Wilson, but we haven't really saw the QCD yet. And so a lot of early day progress is heavily limited by the computational resources we have. And so just giving an idea how much clock, how much computational power that had been improved over the last few decades. In the 1980s, this is the state of the art computer game that you can play in a giant computer, probably take up your whole uh, desk. 
And then today, a lot of kids have this nice, nice little PSP boxes that you can have amazing graphic and a lot more. Com so you just can you have visual ideas of how much uh, computational resources have improved, allow us to uh, really do something more realistic simulation today. And in addition, uh, a lot of our colleagues also work with uh, applied mathematician and sign uh, people from uh, computer sciences. They have come up with very amazing idea that are able to um, really uh, enhance our calculation by at least a factor of 10. So things that might still take 10 years to do in today's technology because of the, the nice algorithm they come out with, we can do it in a year. So that's a huge differences as well. And so now we have that uh, set up and we will start to try to do the uh, latest calculation. And here I'm gonna use Nucleon as an example. Um, so typically um, we would have, we would pick uh, to start the calculation. We will first uh, actually do the QCD vacuum simulation. So what we try to do is capture the, the dynamics of the QCD. And so the, because the, the vacuum of the QCD is an ever evolving state, right? So you don't actually can to do us, you can, you have to kind of do, kind of to take a snapshot for multiple vacuums. And then you, you know, and then you plug them all together. That's how you can describe the QCD vacuum uh, correctly. And this is where the biggest collaboration that you see from the latest calculation comes in because doing the vacuum is actually really complicated and very, very uh, computational intense. And therefore a lot of uh, collaboration are formed so that they can have enough manpower and resources to generate uh, a lot of this QCD vacuum that we are, a lot of us using today. And so they are different choices because we break the rotational symmetry. So you could have different kind of operator that doesn't show up in the continuum. Now you can show up in terms of order A or order A square. When A go to zero, latest spacing A go to zero, they go back to the same continuum. And so you can have various different action choices and people choose them depends on their, their main physics go or sometimes cover symmetry is important. So they will preserve the cover symmetry on the latest and with applies or more computational time required. Sometimes physical physical quantity that you are interested in is not so sensitive to the Kyber symmetry. They are allowed to break that symmetry and you can get to uh, lighter pi on mass of the uh, smaller lazy spacing, bigger value, et cetera. So there's a, a trade off that uh, different collaboration we're doing. And so once you have that, um, then, okay. And then we will create, uh, uh, then you pick a vacuum and then we will create, we will, on top of the vacuum, we will start to put in creating a nucleon in this case. And then we will have, also uh, this is just a, a kind of three dimension in along this direction and the Euclidean time along this direction. So we create a nucleon and then we uh, calculate the quad propagator to an, another Euclidean time and we laminate them and we will pick up uh, the time dependence and try to study the property. Uh, so we put in a pore in between and then we can study the property of that. And the quad propagation, what we call propagator is another very uh, intermediate, really costly uh, uh, object on the latest calculation as well. And so this usually requires us to invert a very large range of the Debar operator matrices. And so that can take out uh, a lot of computation time as well. And then after that, we just had to kind of think about very carefully, make sure that we are actually extracting the true physics. And in the nucleon case, a lot of time we need, we have uh, in the past about five, 10 years or so, people have been realized that we can get the nucleon matrix on the wrong. We don't study the excited state uh, contribution very carefully. And so this is what happened is as you, as we put the nucleon farther and farther away, and then we, we start to see the noise getting, the, the data we receive have much, much larger noises. And so one can get, so here's a one of the example, right? I have three plots here. I have different amounts of uh, the sourcing separation. And these are done by the same amount of measurement. They can see the data point is integrating at the brown and the green points here. And the data itself, you get the error, error kind, of, kind of grow as you go to larger uh, separations. 
And so if you are not very carefully analyzing the exciting state, you might say, hey, the, this is what I get for the ground state matrix element. And by using uh, one state, uh, assuming there's no exciting state existing, and that should give you a plateau of regions. But if you start to include the exciting state degree of freedom into your analysis, and that we usually require having a large statistic data so that the fit will be stable, and you get this band instead. And, and so, so you can see as you go to larger and larger separation, data get noisier, but you also sort of approaching uh, to a specific threshold. And if you start with the uh, analysis that including the, the excited state to start with, you might get worse error, but you will still in the right region or the true ground state. And then of course, when you use a lot more inputs, you can that will how to really confine that ground state instructions. And so this is really important because this sometimes could be tedious because we had to study like every little thing very carefully. But at the end, that's really how we guarantee that we got the, the right, the true ground state that we are studying, say a mixture of, of the state that, that can really mess up the result. And some of the early days of the so-called latest GA crisis, uh, it's kind of related to the not carefulness of studying this kind of matrix on the moon. Then once we've done that, uh, there are also other systematic we need to be careful. We need to think about the, the latest spacing. We, we, we never can simulate directly at A equal to zero. So we can make sure that's uh, either extrapolate to A equal to zero or very carefully study is not a, 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 a big factors. And then later, uh, the, be able to make sure the value is big enough, et cetera. And sometimes in some of this, uh, Metric Solomon, we also need to think about how to renormalize it to MS bar so we can compare with a lot of uh, uh, calculations and extraction in from experiments as well. And so only when you've done that, you actually be able to remove any of the remaining hidden monster that might kind of alter the, the result, the meaning of the latest results. Right, and so the so latest have been contributing uh, to the pattern distribution function do the moment calculation. That means that instead of calculating the, the broken S dependence, we have been calculating the integrals um, of, the, of the distributions. And so, so we can actually write down a local operator that allow us to do the moment directly. And we have been able to do this very well. Uh, people have studied this before in the 90s, 1990s. And today's uh, here, I show you one of the example uh, taken from the, uh, the result from my postdoc center new. Uh, so he was actually, we are able to study uh, the same quantity uh, with the pi on mass dependence and lazy spacey dependence, and also the, the value dependence as well. And not only we have, so here, the left hand side show you the pi on mass dependence. We are actually have more than one physical pi on latest uh, physical pi on mass point here are uh, showing these two green points. The blue band is a simultaneous extrapolation to the continuum limit. And so the heavier points still have to sort of constrain some of the, uh, the pi on mass dependence as well as uh, have providing us point to, uh, to go to the continuum limit. And so, so this is one of the uh, a uh, more comprehensive study that will use a lot of examples, but not everybody uh, does that. So sometimes you might see latest results don't agree with each other. And it's not really a, a, a big issue because sometimes it uh, depends on how people allocate their resources. Not everybody has to spend all the resources just to study a, a number of different uh, systematics, right? So. So in 2017, uh, we have a, 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 a short workshop uh, and try to kind of addressing some of this issue. And we adopt some of the, the uh, like a particle data uh, ratings. And we start to write down the importance of the systematic. So here, just a, a number of different sources of resources, uh, uh, sorry, systematic sources that, uh, that, we, uh, that can alter your uh, latest result. And we make sure that we, there are specific rankings. If it's, uh, ha, they have been studied very well, then you're given a, uh, a, a start. If there are still more work to be done or not much have been addressed, you get the red star. And if it's somewhere, uh, things like finite value effect, 
which maybe uh, either may not be big enough of the, the so-called rule or down uh, sizes or haven't been studied multiple values. And I will give uh, somewhere uh, uh, circles. So when you start to put in this together and then it's kind of, it's a little bit like the particle level, right? Not all measurement or the masses from every experiment have the same way. And you start looking at that and then you can see a, a better picture of how reliable, uh, how you compare uh, the latest result together. And so here's the summary uh, plot that taking from the, the recent uh, review on the status of the moment since 2013. So that these are the latest ones. And so for the, so the user here is at the unpolarized moment. And so we can see that the, the one with the red star is being marked with the open bar. So you can compare them. So they are roughly uh, in a nice agreement. They are different flavor that have been plotting here, depends on what kind of vacuum they pick. And so some of the, uh, uh, for example, NF equal to two is the ISO vector, uh, sorry, it's a, uh, to have ISO spin symmetry for aqua and dunqua, but no strange qua in the vacuum. And then two plus one plus one have uh, aqua dunqua strange in the charm, uh, degree of freedom in the vacuum. And so, so there might be some differences because of the vacuum choices as we see in the moment here. And and more and then we compare with the determinations of the uh, globe, a few of the synthetic global PDF uh, here, and you can see the because the um, unpolarized pattern distribution have a lot of data uh, contributing. So the latest moment right now does not actually doing much better than the global fig ones, but as you start to look at the um, polarized. Um, situation. And so the, the pictures sort of start to shift. Uh, so, the, so the latest calculation wise uh, is, is about the, the difficulty is about the same. But then in the case such, such as the strange, for example, from, from the global fit, there wasn't much data to constrain. So the latest moments are actually doing pretty well. Uh, and some of the cases are actually quite compatible as well. And then if you start looking at the transversity distribution, now you require to have a, a polarized target and the polarized uh, beam to, to get the cleanest uh, measurement. And in those cases that uh, it get a lot more complicated and most of the latest calculations marking as the blue point about and not actually much more precise than what can be determined from very different attempt of, of, the, uh, of the instruction from the pulmonology. Right, and we actually also be able to calculate the moments, uh, which you can provide additional constraint to the structure as well. And so here's some of the uh, summary from that. So, um, so just kind of give you an idea what how this moment can help in this determine the PDF. So the moment actually just sort of comes, you can think about the, for example, the zero moment or the transversity, which is what we call uh, tensor charges. And um, so it, it's actually like a, basically it's the area under the, the PDF. So, so by itself, we actually did not constrain any shapes of what the PDFs will be distributed. So in combining with a global analyzed attempt, uh, here we pick up a, a subset of data, just kind of to see how latest uh, input will help. And so the shape itself, the so we try we use this con latest constraint, which constrain the area that the differences between aqua and dunqua uh, distributions, and on top of that, and then put fit that into the global fit. And so what we this is what we find. Uh, so that the data is only the region of the data available is only roughly on the up to about 0.3 of the BLKMS only. And without the latest input, you get this uh, much un very undetermined yellow bands uh, that you see here. With the latest uh, area constraint, which is this area, then you can shrink the uncertainty by quite a lot, actually. And now, and in combination with the global fit, uh, originally we only had the information about this summation of area. Now we actually can also know about the distribution and the shape and the X dependence. And so this is just one of the, the, the example that with the precision moment uh, calculations, 
that on, on some of the quantity that's last determined on the global VDF side, that this input can be very helpful. So in principle, so we can continue with this dollar trend. In principle, we have enough moments. And at the end, we will be able to use some sort of inverse transformation to, to get the picture of the uh, PDF. However, uh, and especially on the, the transversely polarized data, which we are much, much fully known today. But there are some limitations on the latest calculation in these quantities. Um, at the, so like currently, the most of the calculation are kind of sort of stop about the first moment. There are a couple of recent words start to push that to the second and third at the heavier quant masses, but that's still um, not, not quite been done yet. And they, they do all the beyond about three also, three moments also, a lot of operators start to missing with the lower dimension operator. And many, because we did break the symmetry and as many of you know, when the time you break the symmetry, you have a price to pay. And so that comes in as you, the, it's, it's almost impossible to come up with a, a operator that's clean enough to do the direct calculation without having to deal with a lot of power divergences. And so a lot of this back divergence coming as one over latest spacing, that means that we don't have a clear latest uh, limit to take for some of these operators. And there are some attempt try to using various different method, uh, the references here, uh, try to overcome this problem. Uh, but, but generally also run into another problem is the, 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 the latest calculations, the, the signal to know is get a lot worse as you go to higher moment. So those higher moment, even though eventually you, you've done the calculation, they, the contribution is still gonna be weak because the error will be much bigger as well. So it's not quite clear that, uh, that that's helpful, but, but there are a few glue trying though in those direction and be interesting to see what happened from there. Um, but another direction, which is more, is also very exciting. Okay, okay. all right, oh, okay. All right. All right, sorry. <laughs> All right, so so this is a, I was gonna mention this. This is really something that's really interesting uh, that interests me when I was postdoc in Jefferson Lab. Uh, uh, people know about this problem. They have been some proposal in the past that never been existing calculation uh, to prove that we can be, go beyond some of those uh, moment method. And they have been the same limitation on what latest people can do or generalized pattern distribution function. So we also do a lot of uh, moment for the form factor only and distribution empty to you. And even, you know, even try to think about doing something like Wigner's distribution. Um, so, so this had lead to um, some of the, uh, they, they have been a new idea uh, that it, emerged in 2013 and and so that gave us a new hope to do a lot of these calculations and so I'm going to move on and talk about some of these results um, um, so so Shandong uh, proposed in 2013 Shandong proposed the large momentum effective theory and some people also call it quasi PDF because uh, on the latest um, we are calculating a boosting nucleon in the initial and final state. And we have the same usual quad propagators. And instead of putting a local pole uh, like before, now we have a e equal time and but it's non-local operator uh, to, to uh, intercept some of these quad lines uh, before it dies. And so, so now we will have, we will be studying the matrix ornament not just a typical uh, at zero at rest, we will be we will have a matrix ornament on the momentum dependence as well as the, the distance or the this uh, non-local pool we put in. And so and then you, you calculate a bunch of this type of matrices, right? So you have a say if this is in Z direction, and so they have this Z dependence and the momentum PZ dependence. So we have a bunch of, we calculate, repeating the same step we talk about. There are a lot of matrix ornament to study. And you collect all this matrix ornament and you do a Fourier transformation naively 
Uh, so this is where the, the quasi distribution come in. You have a momentum space distribution, but it's not exactly the Lycone distribution yet. And so, so one can further connect this quasi distribution uh, to the true Lycone distribution over here by uh, taking something we call matching, which you can naively, you can probably think about is sort of um, kind of taking the PZ to infinity limit, um, very naively speaking. And so, and, and all this matching, because we are talking about momentum that's larger than the lambda QCD. So uh, it's usually in the uh, perturbative regions. And so this such matching kernel can be calculated uh, due perturbation uh, theories. And Shandong and his collaborator have done a lot of those and um, providing us a lot of nice uh, calculation to use on the latest QCD calculations. And there's also another type of the, or the method called short distance fertilizations. So instead of expanding things in terms of momentum, they expanding things in terms of the, uh, this, uh, the distance scales. And they are pseudo PDF and various different um, methods that or having some of them have been proposed a while ago, but never having an actual latest calculation until recently. And there are also some idea and some of this idea uh, involving calculate different type of matrix ornament uh, sometimes they have some we call latest people call four point function that you had to put in two probes so you have additional time dependence that come in and and could be uh, connected pieces or disconnected pieces as we see here and and so a lot of this method basically uh, so they we also follow some similarity as well so a lot of this quantity uh, depend doesn't matter what kind of matrix you calculate right one at the end uh, you want to remove all this latest artifact that we discussed earlier that we do with the local matrix settlement. And, and then you try to extract the, the one team could be a pattern distribution function or generalized pattern distribution and any other structures. And they often have a, its own uh, personalized calculated kernels so that you can remove the remaining dependence, uh, either distance or the momentum. And so, so so they all require a uh, large-ish momentum so that you can have a reliable uh, calculation and also the, the Bjorken S uh, regions. So currently, uh, I'm gonna show you some of the results, but uh, you should probably take, take it with a grain of salt. Roughly the intermediate X regions is still what we do, the most reliable ones. And it might depend on the quantity a little bit. This, um, this region, validation region might vary, depends on the momentum use, the setup in general, but roughly uh, we cannot go beyond S below 0.1 reliably yet. And we need to get to much larger boosting momentum. And it's hard to do on the latest. And the kernel is, oops, it's a complicated Anyone? object. Uh, sorry, I, have uh, a, I need to update this. <laughs> there is a question uh, on the previous slide from uh, Thomas. Um, he asked about where is the x is x equal z uh in I, this case in um, the this thomas slide? please join i'm not sure exactly which slide because i don't see it here previous slide here i see i suppose so um is this slide the definition of quasi distribution here he says okay yes yeah, sorry this is uh z direction and this is uh T direction and imagine the SY somewhere uh, in toward the, uh, the page ish. And and, and, uh, and so yes, and again, this is in, in this case is a time. So this uh, some of this uh, method is not, is actually not equal time operator. So you could have uh, in this is also time access as well. So you have to go so up. He clarified in the message says Q tilde is a function of X, but no X on the right hand side in that formula. <sighs> Sorry. Okay, so so we we calculate a list of metric sentiment as a function of Z direction. And then the, this X uh it's oh <laughs> sorry, the, the S is equal to P um the P. Um, the S is equal to KZ divided by PZ, where the, the K, KZ is a, a 
uh, integration parameter we put in. So the, the X uh, later on you see here is the Bjorken X, not the SYZ X. Okay, I think this answers the question. Right, so, um, uh, a, a lot of, uh, so there they are actually uh, a lot of, uh, uh, they are recently uh, kernel calculation, that's next, next leading label, but most of the latest calculation only still only apply to one loop. And this might have changed with the, the first calculation on the next, next leading labels of uh, the Pyong uh, distribution function that's been done uh, with all the details. So this will, will change. Uh, in the next few years. And, and then uh, the short distance perturbation method also suffered a little bit on the inverse problems that, um, that one had to, they are very different way to uh, deal with that. And Sorry then, to interrupt you again, there is another question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, the, the question is also a bit with regard to the previous slide. So how large is large? So how many steps in Z do you have to go to get a good result? In, in terms of momentum? In terms of Z, you have the Wilson line of Z. Oh, Z, steps. okay. So it, it actually is a method dependent. Uh, so the, the sh most of the short distance perturbations, uh, it, uh, you, you need that distance to be as small as possible. That's your uh, basically expansion um, parameters. And so, uh, so that, that's a different requirement. Usually probably if, like point something for me, it, it might get into, depends on the quantity and how people uh, take certain uh, corrections that might vary a little bit. With the Lamont, uh, because we are trying to do the, uh, such a Fourier transformation. So you do have to reach a little bit larger distance and they, it does run into uh, problems such as, uh, uh, you do run into problems such as the higher, higher power uh, or higher trees correction, they can all come in. And so there are uh, special treatments uh, The Shandon and all and collaborator have proposed a few uh, idea how to minimize those uh, contribution. But still, uh, but, it is also having uh, reaching larger the displacement, uh, also getting difficult on the latest because the uh, the the signal to noise also get worse pretty quickly as you increase the displacement as well. So that's the uh, the main issue that one had to still had to deal with. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to make a mm -hmm. quick comment here. Um, <laughs> to make a short distance expansion, you really need to have um, the separation Z on the order of 0.2 Fermi or less, because beyond that, uh, the high twist contribution is going to be out of control. Uh, to for the in the uh, large momentum effective theory, uh, we know that the large Z contribution only affects a small x. So therefore, the the systematic um, effective field theory expansion works in the middle region. Uh, without um, accurate knowledge about what happens in large correlations. I hope this helps. All right, so I, I just want to, so here's a slide I tried to put together um, all this recent development. Uh, so it's actually quite a lot in terms of um, in, in, with the latest community, there are a lot of methods that have been uh, since 2013. Uh, some of them are new method, and some of them are old method, but finally be able to calculate um, in today's uh, computer settings. And so they have been, they have, I don't think there have been so many different approaches having all appear in such a short time frame in the latest calculation, and also have very different diverse uh, Quantity in pions and 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 uh, uh, in terms of amplitude of um, distribution amplitude etc. And there are also a lot of nice milestone quantity that a lot of some of these structures. So I I I don't think everybody can read all of this, but I just want to point out that you can see that there are a lot of developments, a uh, new quantity being calculating using some of this method. And I do have a link, uh, if you have the slides later on, it, it, it actually linked to individual papers 
as well. But again, just there are so many activity and so many new quantity that we cannot previously done using the very, we can only do it very limitedly with the moment method. Now we can attempt to extract, to extract a lot of broken edge structure. And so I'm running a little bit out of time, uh, going a little bit slower than what I did. I'm just going to quickly gun do this a little bit. Uh, so here, here are the state of the art or the pattern distribution uh, in a way in terms of the, the latest systematic concern. Uh, so they have been uh, physical pattern mass calculation. So that usually take uh, quite a few years since the first calculation. And there are multiple methods that have been, um, have been used in uh, looking at the differences between up quark and the down quark uh, distribution functions. And so here's a, a quick summary and the different um, momentum that uh, each different collaboration uses. But more or less, you see there, there are some uh, overall nice agreement among different methods and different action choices. And you're not gonna see a perfect match because they are still things like, uh, right now all this calculation being done only one latest spacing. So they are uh, dependents like that haven't been addressed and they, they people use different values uh, settings. So there might be some variation on that, but overall uh, a, a reasonable agreement. And it is, and then you come, it's all very similar to what you expect from the uh, uh, a global PDF fit as well, with, but they are with a slightly larger arrow at the moment. And, but if you look at the uh, things like uh, uh, transversely polarized pattern distribution functions. And um, so here on, I only take the result from the physical power mass uh, results so far. Uh, so there are only two calculations, but uh, we can see the latest calculations actually can be more precise, uh, uh, much more precise than the biological determination, which have a lot of uh, uncertainty due to the difficulty of analyzing them reliably with the limiting data they have. And so, so, so there are some, some quantity that we can verify and some quantity that they just can really help improve as well. And there are many, there are various different type of quantity that people have tried and people start to work in with the global PDF community as well to use latest inputs, et cetera. That will probably another entirely talk as well. And I was going to quickly mention a few things that um, my student tried. So, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, there, there's this large uncertainty unknown in the uh, strange uh, distribution, especially with this uh, strange anti-strange symmetry uh, assumptions. So, um, so one of let me sorry, let me get to. So this is a calculation done by one of my former students. Um, so we are again uh, we are doing the calculations on uh, um, two heavier pi on masses then extrapolate to physical one, just kind of to get a, an idea what we will see on the latest since nobody had done this before. And so one of the things we are really interested in looking at is this uh, a strange uh, anti-strange symmetries. So the real metric settlement, so we, like I said, we calculate this different displacements. So we have a function of momentums, which indicate by different color points here. And then uh, also a different displacement and we use a dimensionless products. So you have a, a various different displacements. And so the integral uh, the real metric summons corresponding to the integral of the S minus S bar. And now which we can see at this within our um, calculation is mostly agreed with a zero. And then here are the bands that plotting with the global PDF with the CT18, uh, uh, global fit, which assume as equal to as, as bar, so we get complete zero. And then the and then PDF uh, try to lose that constraint. So they but so it's roughly shown in the, the green green band, oh, sorry, the blue band over here. And so you can see that latest edge calculation actually could have, if we can use the latest point to constrain the global PDF, there is a, a potential to further reduce the uncertainty on the strange PDF in the global PDF fit. And then we also try to take a look of the, the same assumptions also be made for the charm as well. So we also look at the charm as well. In, in this case, everybody have assumed them this symmetry to be exact. So you, you can really have a, a comparison there. But again, the quantity, uh, the, the metric settlement is about a magnitude smaller as we expected because the, the heavy cross question as well. 
and, uh, and is also quite consistent with the zero. And my student also had been looking at the, uh, the gluon PDF. I don't want to take out too much time. I just want to show some of our attempt uh, to do the, the such a calculation. And, and um, right now we are still um, having much larger error bar than the global PDF, but we are hoping to be able to reduce them in the near future. And sorry for skipping. And I just want to show, uh, we also, uh, we started looking at the Paiyang and the Kayangs as well from two of my great students uh, or that they are on, on the Gluang PDF as well. So the Paiyang and the Meizang is much, much harder to, to study than the Nucleons. And so, so uh, in the Kayang case, we actually uh, are making prediction and we are comparing, we try to find some uh, the other of the logical determination to kind of see how, how we get in, in terms of this result. And then we are also be able to do calculation on the valence quarks for the pi and k -ions. And in this recent work, we are uh, attempt to do a, a sort of naive uh, continuous extrapolation, only two latest spacing, uh, but, but we can, uh, come out with the, the pi on distributions and as well as the, the K on the ratio plot that people have been uh, studying for a long time ago. And we are awaiting for new experimental data to uh, refine some of these data points. And there are some efforts to try to uh, study a lot of uh, removing the, the systematics from the pattern distribution calculation. So, so in terms of finite values, for example, you can study multiple values, like I say, and then you study the dependence of that uh, pattern distribution function. Sometimes you don't see a significant impact. Sometimes you could, and it can, could depend on the, the property of the vacuum and the method in general as well. And there are also many efforts try to kind of study the latest spacing uh, dependence, uh, often at the heavier quantum masses, but that really allow us to kind of um, get, get some idea how, how fine the latest spacing is needed for such calculations. And they are also a, a attempt to try a very small latest spacing as well and try to compare that with other results. So I'm going to skip this and hoping have a few minutes to talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the generalized pattern distribution function. Uh, so this is, by name, and so you actually give us more information than the pattern distribution functions. So sometimes people like to talk about, think about this a pattern distribution function, give us some sort of one dimensional structure and that uh, the generalized pattern distribution not allow giving us a more three dimensional structure because I have a lot more embedding information there. And this is the picture taken from this paper. And so, if I only have a few minutes to talk about this, uh, so one thing you want to think about is uh, one of the uh, one of the thing we, we really like to visualize as we, we saw the, the, uh, the white paper from the EIC, we want to really imaging out the photon. So you can think about that is if you can shrink it really small, even beyond the, 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 the atom size, uh, very small, what we look like uh, when you travel uh, in the nuclear or any other hadrons. And so, so this is one of the things we, we try to uh, kind of understand that. I'm gonna skip this, sorry. And so on the latest, now we will do, we, again, we take the vacuum, we create a nucleon, uh, using nucleon example again. And then we, now, we, now, we will, now we will have the initial and the final nucleon at different momentum. So now we can also study the momentum differences uh, dependence as well in the transformation momentum differences. And again, we study the same uh, displacement dependence as well. So now we will have uh, not only the PZ dependence, the distance in terms of uh, the Wilson light displacement, now we also have a Q dependence. And now we also need to solve for the generalized, uh, uh, sorry, this is not the, okay. So this is, uh, so now we also need to solve the uh, the GPD uh, factors that have all this dependence there. And the, the, the Q squared dependence sometimes being uh, written as a, a, a T instead. So we have done this with the pions uh, a while ago, uh, just kind of try to get some ideas on how the Namong uh, can uh, be 
uh, extrapolate a study uh, uh, using this case and having any chances of saving any signal at all. And so again, I mentioned I has a lot of initial study, we often study at the heavier quant masses. In this case, about 310, uh, about a little bit more than twice of the physical power mass. And we have we, we weren't having large momentum, but we are able to kind of study the some of the uh, um, for one limits uh, with the, uh, a little bit of the uh, a few of the T differences in, in terms of dependence here. And with the later calculations, uh, we are we can expand into look at nucleon and try out the physical pion masses. So now we are looking at the nucleon GPD. Again, we start we look at the difference between aqua and down quad. It's easier to calculate with the latest calculations. And I'm just going to show you some of the I'm sorry result um and and so so now now we can extrapolate we can get out the gpd function and now we can go back and ask another question and which is how is the calculation from this new x dependent method compared with what latest have been calculated in the past 10 20 years using the moment approach so so now we extrapolate, we got the, the, the GPD function, say H functions. Now we can take the integral and then we can get out, get the, the some of this, uh, what latest have been calculated in terms of generalized form factors. And so here's this one, say if we use N equal to one, so I can compare with the vector, uh, electric magnetic, uh, electric form factors that uh, they are a lot of latest calculation that being done. Uh, a lot of them are actually a physical pion mass. So that's what I, a few results I pick, right? So I integrating one very different point and the integral of the GPD function give us this green band and which is actually um, kind of nicely agree-ish. Uh, again, I mentioned we they are latest space independence. We are not taking account into, but, but roughly uh, they were in nice agreement, which really demonstrate that the method really works well. Uh, with the, when you take the n equal to two, say with the e uh, generalized uh, GPDs, and they are some uh, they are some this not so well agreement, but overall they 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 are roughly in the right magnitudes. And this kind of quantity, even using moment, is not easy to calculate. And um, uh, the, the, sometimes people do see much bigger systematic as well. So again, this is all one latest spacing calculation that I'm picking from uh, other calculation. And uh, but overall, it's kind of give us a really nice confidence on how this, this all this method work well and then kind of started converging with what we know previously and what we've done previously. But now we can extract more information out of this. And then one can try to uh, play around and look at this uh, tomography that people have been talking about and only being able to do this using very different uh, GPD models. Now we are able to uh, uh, do this for the first time on the latest and it's kind of fun to kind of uh, plug in this as a as dependence uh, and you get uh, go uh, decay really the, the whole uh, GPT function uh, decrease very quickly as you increase in larger uh, X as well. And then one can do the same for the uh, helicity GPT as well. And so we see slightly different structure. It's going to be a little bit larger in quantities. And similarly, one can also compare with the taking the moments and compare with the previous calculating uh, moment method. And the new method actually, again, uh, it's quite reasonably compared with most of the calculations as well. And then I mentioned that is sometimes you do see a bigger systematic even among the moment method itself. And so um, I think I'm really a little bit late. Um, so they, they are still a lot of work to be done. Uh, so there are some success that we see so far, there's still a lot of work to be done. And so in this community white papers, uh, we do discuss a lot of issues that still need to be addressed with many, many methods as well. Uh, the large momentum, we like to see the momentum as large as probably 5 GeV. Uh, there are some of the linear divergence one, one we need to be studied and being subtracted in our calculations. And then uh, we want to 
we have some attend on the gluon, gluonic observables on some of the what we call disconnected diagram contribution, but we need to improve them so we can have more precise uh, PDF determination from the latest. Uh, there, there are method, there are uh, inverse problem uh, that also we want to make sure that they are, uh, uh, we can remove as much model dependence as possible from latest QCD calculation and get into the long range correlate. Uh, the uh, much larger Wilson line displacement in the NAMO method will, will be uh, really help us to push down that sm the small edge region that we can uh, do uh, on the latest. All right, I'm, I'm just going to summarize my talk here. Uh, it's really exciting era to use latest QCD to study the single hadron structures. Uh, we are making a lot of progress and a lot of more and more calculation has been done at physical power mass. And we have been able to overcome some of the long standing limitation using the traditional moment method. So a lot of uh, Bilkan S dependence, exciting results that have been coming up uh, more and more. And we are trying to address the systematic. And so we will have more precise determination in the future. And we also start to think about the, some of these very noisy in quantity, such as gluon and the disconnected loop, and hopefully that will help us uh, obtain better precise uh, determination of the flavor dependence quantity. So stay tuned for more update from latest QCD. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for a nice presentation. Now we'll have some time for questions. And uh, the first question goes to Stan. Stan, please go ahead. Yeah, you very nice talk. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. So very nice talk. But years ago, there was a method proposed by Bardeen and uh, and Pearson, I believe, and that was on uh, using the light front Hamiltonian theory to do light front QCD. Then there's no infinite momentum about thing. You're just looking exactly the way the experiment looks. You're looking at fixed light front time. It's like on your first slide where you show the movie. You're really looking at the proton at fixed light front time, not ordinary time. And then you don't have to do the infomentum frame boost. So what happened to that method? It seemed like that was the natural method to, to actually analyze all the problems with the lattice gauge theory. And I know uh, Simon Dolly had extensive papers on this and so on. So I know it was well developed. So what has happened to that method, which seems so natural? Um, I'm I don't think I'm familiar with the method. Oh, um, okay. Shandong, did you? Uh, yeah, I can comment on that. Um, <laughs> the method that got a transverse lattice method, that is um, oh. longitudinal direction is still uh, Minkowski. And um, so therefore you still have to solve the Hamiltonian problem. Right. And um, so the formulation here in lattice is really in terms of the Euclidean space into Lagrangian formulation. And so the methods are, even though they're, you know, both have lattices, but they're a very different kind of setup. Uh, one is Hamiltonian setup, another hand Lagrangian formula setup. Right. One is the Minkowski space here is a completely Euclidean space formulation. So, and I don't think people really have made much progress using that transverse lattice method. Yeah, so why can't one do the Euclidean space with the, with the light front? It's confusing. It seems like it's natural to just use the... Well, Euclidean space, the, you have the imaginary time. Yes. And, um, and, and so therefore the time is not re real time. That's right. And, um, and so therefore, if you want to do real time, you need to um, doing um, an elite continuation. So that's what people, you know, you may be using quantum computer, they can solve a real time problem. But with a classical computer, the real com time problem is a so-called NP, um, you know, NP problem. But, it, but it, in today's talk, you're using Euclidean time as well. I mean, the ordinary uh, not a, not in the light front the light front you have really the real time in there um so you can't really straightforward it and, oh, okay. and, and transport into euclidean okay. yeah i thought you could probably do euclidean time with the front form but maybe i'm wrong no you cannot okay no. it's a hamiltonian formulation yes okay 
I have another question, which is, if I may. Go ahead. And that ahead. is, uh, so on the charm distribution, there's, uh, it, there is now published papers on the charm distribution from lattice gauge theory. Uh, C and C bar very different. And the, the argument is, uh, Kefe Lu is involved, Draper, many other people. And the, uh, the calculation comes out that the C and the C bar are very different, especially at large X where C is very, greatly dominates over the C bar. And this comes from using the proton form factor, the charm contribution of the form factor, which would be zero unless you had an extensive C versus C bar asymmetry. So I hope you're not in contradiction with that because that's really a big advance in the uh, charm structure function. And it also agrees with the experiment at large X as well. So there really is, so you cannot, it, you, 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 you of course always have a C and C bar symmetry and that's what causes the, the proton elastic form factor charm contribution. So I hope you look at this. I mean, there's a little worried that you seem to be in contradiction with that. Um, we, we can take a look at that. So, so one of the nice thing we, we, we do here is we also, so in terms of looking at the charm degree of freedom, so you usually need a, a charm core uh, degree of freedom in the vacuum as well. So right now there are many two big collaboration that's generating the QCD vacuum that have the charm degree of freedoms. So there might be some dependence in terms of the vacuum choices. And uh, charm can be also quite sensitive to the latent spacing because it's much heavier. And so, uh, so we are at the, yeah, I will look up the detail afterwards on um, some of these choices. In of course, the, the, strange, the strange work is also asymmetric too, but it's sort of very dramatic for the charm case. Even though the probability is about 1%, very, very small, the asymmetry is striking. And that's, it's consistent with the intrinsic charm physics, which is a rigorous part of QCD. So please look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Those papers. Well, thank you for, for the suggestion. I think it might be useful, right? Okay, any other questions from the audience? Um, uh, Shandong, please go ahead. Yeah, Huyven, can you go back to uh, slides number 30? Oh, <laughs> I misremembered. It must be 29 then. One more slide's over. Yes. So here you made a comparison of um, pseudo and quasi PDF. For those people who have a terribly difficult time to understand um, what are the differences, um, basically both methods use the same lattice data. So you generate the data on the lattice. Then you analyze the lattice data using two different kinds of expansions. And quasi PDF is using the large momentum expansion and which is the expansion made um, as PZ gets large. And so this method, you can only calculate PDFs in the middle X region. And so, it, it does not give you results for X very close to zero or very close to one, just like in an experiment. Mm -hmm. Whereas a pseudo PDF is a, a short distance coordinate space expansion. And in that expansion, um, basically you do an OPE and you try to invert you know, it's like, like calculating a few moments you, you try to invert to get the part-time distributions. And the latter approach, that is the pseudo PDF approach, you need to assume what a part-time distribution look like, you know? And so people always say, well, it looks like X to the R5 or minus X to the beta, but the, the former method, the, the quality PDF or large momentum effect of theory uh, there's no assumption about an X dependence. The X dependence is calculated out of, you know, the, the lattice data. So it's a direct calculation. And, um, and you can also show rigorously that the larger momentum expansion always uses more lattice data than the short distance is, is, uh, expansion. And, and so therefore, 
and by by you know it's almost like a theorem it always produ produces more accurate results um Louvain has been uh, very diplomatic and, and, and be nice, but I wanted to make that uh, important clarification here. Thank you. Hui uh, Wen, did you need to add anything to the comment or basically we could move on? No, I think we can move on with this. Okay, we have another question from Thomas Schaefer, please. So, um... I have a maybe naive question, possibly related to what Zheng Nong just said. So if you do an experiment, then in order to use OP and so on, we need to go to large energy and large Q squared to suppress target mass and higher twist. Mm -hmm. And here, if you do these quasi distribution functions, you need to go to large Euclidean boost momentum to suppress higher twist and target mass. But these two scales that you somehow have to reach, they're presumably not directly related. So the, the kind of higher twist corrections to ordinary DIS in an actual experiment and the corrections to the lattice experiment are presumably somehow different. So a priori, we don't know what that P max scale has to be, even if we already know mm -hmm. how high we have to go in an actual experiment. And it seems to me that in, you know, you seem to suggest that you don't actually, like we wouldn't dream of doing a DIS experiment at two GeV. That would sound insane. But apparently a boost, mom a Euclidean boost momentum of two GeV is enough to get something reasonable. Do we understand why that is, why you don't need 50 GeV? Um, I, I, I don't think we know that but we do so i do uh so most of this study actually use multiple momentum and mm -hmm. so what well, well, we, the late individual paper have been uh, looking carefully on some of the mom when 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 it's available yeah so they are looking at the momentum dependence as well in terms of the what they get in terms of the distributions and a lot of them are in, indeed reporting uh, smaller air, uh, dependence on some of these momentums. And I don't, I don't really, I don't know. I don't think we quite know why the, um, that's a good question. I don't think we know that. Uh, we, 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 what we do is we, we sort of doing some numerical experiment with the calculation we have, but um, yeah. But I mean, you I must have had add, an inkling think, yeah. because somehow if it really required 10 GeV, then you wouldn't have tried. Um, because I, I the, the, uh, can add some comment to Wibens. Uh, one, Thomas, one, why don't you finish your question? I can, I can comment on that. No, I mean, uh, yeah, so just go ahead. Uh, okay. So if you look at the deep as a scattering, and you see the parton physics in the Bjorkin frame, in which the momentum of the nucleon is moving almost like equal to Q. So therefore, the PZ, P here is really like um, the Q. And so therefore, P square will correspond to about a Q square. So if you have a 2 GeV, you have Q square around 4 GeV. If you have a P equal to three GeV, you have P squared equal to nine GeV. Um, so therefore that this, the large moment effective theory basically is expansion mm -hmm. in terms of lambda QCD over P max. And, um, and so you, you, you mm -hmm. mentioned correctly, there is a, there is a mass correction. Um, but if you work it out carefully, it turns out that the mass correction goes like a, the nuclear mass divided by to PZ. So if you square that, uh, if you get PZ equal to about uh, 2 GeV, so you have an expansion parameter that goes like, you know, M over 2 PZ and square it, which is about, you know, one tenth. So therefore that if you have, um, if you have a PZ around 2 GeV, in the middle X region, the expansion parameter is about a one tenth. So, um, the catch here is actually when you go to smaller and larger x, 
the expansion parameter is not really the mass or lambda QCD divided by PZ, but rather is X times PZ or one minus X times PZ. So therefore, the expansion methods at present time only works for X, let's say between 0.2 to 0.8, okay? Or even if you want to be more conservative, maybe 0.3 to 0.6, something like that. Um, so as the momentum gets bigger and bigger, uh, you can go to a smaller and smaller X region. And so therefore this method is not gonna allow, uh, um, help you to calculate PDF at X equal 10 to minus two. And um, so the only middle X region works. I hope this helps. Okay. Okay, thank you. I, I think Thomas is muted now. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, good. Any other questions from the audience before we'll start wrapping this up? Uh, please, Graziana Malera, go ahead. Thank you. Hello. Uh, could you explain to me how the experimental apparatus uh, interferes in this uh, measurement uh, on the uh, biomass? Do you mm -hmm. understand? Sorry, did you mind repeat the question again? <laughs> uh, sorry. Could you explain to me how the experimental apparatus interferes in these measurements you have made on the pion mass? Um, um, uh, on the pion mass, sorry. Uh, the dependence on the pion mass, or you mean uh, the physical pion mass uh, value? The physical pion mass. Um, so. Not sure uh, yeah. we fully understand the question, right? So uh, perhaps how this uh, results for the distribution functions match the experiment measurements? Is that roughly the spirit yes, of the question? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, in this okay. Slide, in this slide. Okay. Oh, right. So, so here are the latest calculations, and then here are just a few of the selected um, global PDF that we pick up at the time or when we write this report. And so they are uh, in in terms of the 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 quark distributions. Uh, the 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 difference between aqua and dunqua, which is the most calculating ones. Um, so they are actually quite quite compatible. Uh, you see, other than we still need to sort of improve our arrows. Um, so most of the error here are systematic only. And so we still need to improve on that. And um, they are also helicity results that, that's showing in the report. I didn't think I have time to show it. And so that's become more comparable. And the most, most uh, biggest uh, the contribution natives can make is with, with the uh, transversity, because we uh, the, you can see the, the differences are pretty large uh, from the, just more difficult to extrapolate this information from the theory and also experimental, uh, limited experimental data. I, I hope that address your questions. Is that okay? Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Um, well, uh, I think I had some question of my own, but it was almost ex answered. Anyway, let me try to, uh, to formulate the best way I, I had. So, um, at some point when you were showing the results for the moments of the distributions, somewhere around pages, I don't remember, 14, 15 or so, um, it seemed, uh, I got an impression that uh, if you uh, use your lattice results, you could better interpret the data and in fact constrain the experimental data. Is, is that the correct uh, understanding how you were presenting it? or? do we uh, have sort of like a prediction that could be further uh, verified by doing a better experiment? So I, I 
I was confused about this point a little. Okay, so um, so so they are all, so this depends on on the which moment we talk about. So in terms of unpolarized uh, moments, because uh, they allow a lot more data to constrain the distribution. So the overall on um, okay, actually yes, I do have it here. Uh, so you can see the, the, the if you take the moment um, from the global fit and majority of them are, uh, it's going, you're going to see a relatively nicer, better determination, uh, assuming mm -hmm. there's all the theory uncertainty that's being included. And so at the moment, uh, some of the latest calculations still are relatively noisy in, in, in comparison. But again, as you start to tune, oops, Okay, I don't have it. Um, I can put this after after the talk. I do have another slide with the helicity distribution in terms of numbers. Um, we can see this from the plot as well, right? And and so in, in terms of uh, uh, we start to having polarized target or polarized being. Now you look at the helic linear uh, polarized distributions, and there are quantity that uh, such as the strange contribution. Um, on the integral of that quant zero moment, uh, the latest actually have a, a lot more precise uh, uh, calculations. And so I would say the takeaway is really uh, that this can be come uh, in terms of moment, right? Moment by itself doesn't tell us how the PDFs would look like, but it, it can be complementary to the experimental measurement. If we use the latest inputs to constrain the global fit that we can give the best of our experiment and also the latest calculation and cover more precise PDF in that way. Right, thanks. That, that's precisely what I, I got an impression, but I wanted to clarify because I wasn't quite sure. Okay, uh, thank you. I don't see any other raised hands. So using this opportunity, I would like to thank Hui Wang for a very nice presentation with a lot of information and data. And uh, with that, I think we should st start wrapping this up. Thank you. Thank you.